Kitching Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak uh, on this bill, but before I do, I'd like to address a number of the issues that have been raised uh, by my colleagues in this uh, debate here today. And I would note up front that the majority of evidence didn't actually go to the specific provisions of the bill itself. Instead, much of the debate from those opposite, and particularly from my Greens colleagues, raised matters that dealt with that have been dealt with by five previous parliamentary inquiries uh, onto this matter, as did the speeches here today. Senator Carr, I did note that he did acknowledge that these are customs amendment bills, but then he did go on for a substantial period of his speech in re-prosecuting some of the, the case. And uh, I have to hand it to uh, Senator Hanson Young and her colleagues here today. I didn't think that we'd hear so many uh, Greens' ideological buzzwords. It was almost a buzzwords bingo between the four of them here today. Uh, lots of discussions about chilling effects, neoliberalism, economic rationalism, and neoliberalism. But as uh, the minister has just said, it was very clear that uh, from uh, the debate today, as uh, Senator Kitching has just acknowledged, they clearly haven't read the bill itself, and the debate would have been uh, significantly enhanced had they actually addressed the detail of the, of the bill. But in relation to there's four issues that were raised in the debate today that I would like to briefly cover. Uh, the first is the issue of modelling, and it was mentioned by some of the speakers uh, that they wanted more modelling to be done. But I do note that the significant amount of modelling has been done, and uh, which has been mentioned before in this place. But the thing is that just because you don't like the outcome of the modelling doesn't invalidate it. And again, we've just heard from Senator Kitching on the Victorian government modelling, which clearly showed there were significant short term and then even more benefits in the longer term. So um, I, I think that's a, a real furphy, and, and I'm glad that my Labor colleagues have uh, made that very clear. The second issue that has been raised in the debate is on the issue of consultation. And both Labor and Greens colleagues uh, indicated that they didn't think there had been enough consultation. Well, I can advise uh, senators that there were a thousand briefings. I'll say that again: a thousand briefings with 485 stakeholders. And I'm, I'm actually at a loss to, to realise or to understand who wasn't actually consulted. So, in these thousand briefings with 485 stakeholders, all the states and territories were consulted. All the federal government departments all relevant peak bodies, uh, you know, hundreds of companies, academics, unions and civil society groups. So I'm not really quite sure what more consultation uh, those opposite uh, would like to have seen. Now, the third issue that's been debated and discussed at some length in this debate is the issue of labour market testing. And it is very clear from the debate from uh, both ourselves and the opposition that while they ideologically, and I think Senator Kitching uh, acknowledge that this is not new. It is a reciprocal requirement. We can hardly ask people to um, do something that we're not willing to do ourselves. And again, the evidence does not support what my Green colleagues have been saying about labour market testing, and including some of those from the Labor Party. The evidence is very clear. Uh, in our free trade agreements with China, Japan, and Korea, when you have a look at the evidence. Uh, so, listening to those opposite, you'd think that under those three free trade agreements, 457 and other visas would have skyrocketed. But in fact, Mr Acting Deputy President, for those three countries, the experience has been that 457 visas has actually dropped by 10 per cent since those uh, treaties were negotiated. So again, it is not new. It is something we have done for a long time, and the, there is absolutely no evidence to show that under the, this agreement it would be any different. And the fourth issue I'd like to briefly uh, mention is this issue of ISDS. Again, it is a complete and utter furphy, and uh, as Senator Kitching has just reminded us, it's uh, actually a very good thing, and it's something that's been very long-standing in a wide range of treaties that we've entered into, but it is simply a, a labour union ideological policy um, issue. So, there is no loss of sovereignty, and despite all the huffing and puffing from the Green senators this afternoon, there is no loss of sovereignty, as the minister has very clearly uh, said. 
So now moving on to the bill itself, and, and I will foreshadow, Mr Acting Deputy President, that for those reasons I've just outlined, uh, that the government will not be supporting the three foreshadowed second reading amendments. But on to the, uh, to the bill itself. The Customs Amendment um, Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership Bill 2018 amends the Customs Act 1901 to implement Australia's obligations under the TPP 11. These amendments are com uh, com complementary to those contained in the Customs Tariff Amendment Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership Bill 2018. And I'd like to take this opportunity to speak uh, to the two bills that are in front of, here, in front of us here today as they are very much related. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to conclude the debate on this important agreement. Mr Acting Deputy President, there is absolutely no doubt that the TPP 11 is one of the most comprehensive trade deals ever concluded by Australia, and it will eliminate more than 98 per cent of tariffs in a trade zone that spans the Americas and Asia, with a combined GDP worth $13.7 trillion. Again, despite uh, the arguments or well, the rhetoric from those opposite, and particularly the Greens, Australian farmers, manufacturers and service exporters will benefit from new market access opportunities in economies with nearly 500 million consumers. It will provide better access for farm exporters, including for beef and sheep meat producers, dairy producers, cane growers and sugar millers, as well as cereal and grains exporters. There will be new opportunities for our rice growers, cotton and wool growers, horticultural producers and our great wine exporters. One manufacturer will benefit from the elimination of tariffs, for example, on industrial goods. Our services exporters will have access to liberalised and improved regulatory regimes for investment, notably in the mining and resources sectors, telecommunications and financial services. TPP 11 is truly a next generation trade agreement. And for the first time in a trade agreement, TPP 11 countries will guarantee the free flow of data across borders for services suppliers and investors as part of their business activity. And I know from feedback from uh, industry that is a great thing for them. This movement of information or data flow is relevant to all kinds uh, of businesses. And uh, if Australia and five other countries can complete ratification before December 31st this year, there will be two opportunities for tariff reductions, the first on entry into force and the second on the 1st of January 2018. But on the other hand, if, as those opposite and on the crossbenchers suggest, if we're into, the, into this year without Australia, our exporters would absolutely unequivocally be placed at a significant competitive disadvantage. And that benefits no Australian business and it certainly does not benefit Australian workers. For example, New Zealand and Canada would have superior access to the Japanese beef and dairy markets, better access to Japanese cheese market and better access to wine markets in Mexico. So why would we knowingly and willingly give our market competitors a, a, a leg up uh, before us. But the deal signed on the 8th of March 2018 is one that fundamentally serves Australia's national interest. Its scope and level of ambition cannot be underestimated. It will create new opportunities and greater certainty for our businesses and encourage job creating foreign investment. That is very clear, and despite what those opposite have said, that will occur. Because it will make Australian exports more competitive. So our farmers can sell more produce, our professionals can provide more services, and our manufacturers can make and sell more goods. Our involvement in the negotiation of this deal means Australia plays a key role in setting 21st century rules for commerce across the world's fastest growing region. This will enable us to tackle new trade and investment barriers as they arise, helping our businesses weather the increasingly challenging global trading environment. Here in Australia, this agreement has undergone a level of scrutiny I suspect is almost unprecedented by any other free trade agreement. It has been subject to five parliamentary committee inquiries, and after the TPP 11 was tabled in the House of Representatives on 26 March this year, it was examined by the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. And on 22 August, 
The committee recommends that Australia take, a binding, take binding treaty actions in respect of the, two, two, the TPP 11. So for all of these reasons, I urge the parliament to support the swift passage of TPP 11 implementing legislation because I and this government want Australia to remain leaders amongst trading nations, a country that is not afraid to show our trading partners in concrete actions that we are committed to a future of liberalised trade and investment. This is what these TPP 11 implementation bills represent. Our early ratification of the TPP 11 demonstrates Australia's leadership in pursuing liberalised trade globally. And I believe it embodies the government's strong commitment to maximising trading opportunities for Australian businesses, both large and small. The TPP 11 outcome is a feature of an ambitious and confident trade policy, one that didn't turn back at the first hurdle, an audacious but pragmatic and successful approach. And that, in my view, has been the hallmark of this government's trade and investment policy. I have great pleasure in commending these bills to the Senate. Thank you, Minister.